ladies and gentlemen, Professor Dudley Kingsnorth. My presentation today, I will be fairly brief, outlining, outlining a number of highlights of my view of the rare earths industry to allow some time for uh, questions. I am an independent uh, consultant. I, I don't, I'm not retained by any company on the basis of reward for my efforts. I provide advice on, on the basis of a fee. Um, and I don't have any shares or any any, any shares in any rare earth companies. Presentation today, I'll talk about the brief history of the industry, forecast demand and supply, China's beleaguered, in fact it's beleaguered by illegal production and some conclusions. Over the last 50 years, the rare earth industry has grown in volume by a factor of about 30. That's Quite outstanding. There are not very many commodities in which we've seen such a growth in demand. And that growth in demand has been driven by the development essentially of new technologies. And over the last 20 to 30 years, that's largely been based upon the use of neodymium, praseodymium, and dysprosium in the production of rare earth magnets, which is, we're all aware, a very powerful magnets. On the other hand, technology has led to some changes in demand for rare earths. The development of LEDs to replace fluorescent lights uh, has reduced the demand for rare earths in those lighting applications to about 10 to 15 percent of the demand for, for a fluorescent light. Now, fluorescent lights will continue to be manufactured, but that is having a big impact on the demand for phosphorus. That's brief history of demand recently. As we're all aware, in 2010, China suspended shipments of rare earths to Japan and at the same time reduced um, its export quotas. As a result, we saw a significant increase in prices in 2011, which led to a fall in demand in 2011-12. It's taken about five years for that demand to recover. And in the last two years, 2014, 2015, we've seen demand grow at about five to 7% per annum, which I see continuing, maybe strengthening in the coming years. So future demand and supply. Well, the situation today is that we, total demand, estimated demand is about 140, 150 tons per annum rare earth oxide. The global, the value of that uh, production is about two to four billion. China is the dominant force in the industry, of which we're all aware, producing about 80 to 90% of the world's rare earths and consuming about 60 to 70%. Outside China, Linus has taken a long time to start up and last year did actually achieve uh, production on a positive cash flow basis. Unfortunately, in the first quarter of this year, we've continued uh, falling of, a continued falling of prices in rare earths. We actually made a loss in, in the first quarter of this year. That just shows how tough it is for companies outside China to start new projects, given the impact of the illegal mining in China. But more of that later. So that's global rare earth demand in 2015. I don't intend to go into any great detail, except to point out that demand for the magnet sector is about 45,000 tonnes a year, and demand for the metal alloys, primarily that's used in, in, in batteries, is about 25,000 tonnes. And those are the two areas that are going to grow significantly over the next few years. And, and as I've said, I don't see this uh, changing, changing much. Forecast growth over the next few years. In catalysts, we'll probably see demand increase by about uh, four to six percent per annum. Glass, that could grow at four to six percent, but maybe more. There's a huge surplus of cerium at the moment, and I do believe with the increasing surplus of cerium, reduced prices, we could see a return to the use of cerium uh, as a decolorant in, in many more applications rather than just high tech applications. Metal alloys, I've mentioned that briefly. Uh, it's, we'll come back to this later, but China is forecasting quite a significant increase in demand for the metal alloys. Magnets, talked about that, phosphors. So overall, 
The growth in demand over the next five to 10 years, I believe is going to be in the range of about six to 8% per annum. What does that mean? Demand increases from an estimated uh, 45,000 tonnes uh, this year to about 65,000 tonnes in 2020. China. China has taken a long-term view towards the development of its rare earth resources. And we're all aware that in 1992, Deng Xiaoping said, the Middle East has oil and China has rare earths. And what's that meant, what that has meant over the past 50 years is that China has gradually moved downstream. Their goal is to maximize the benefit to the Chinese people of their abundant resources and great resources of rare earths. It's been very gradual, but they're very patient people. Now this has been achieved, they've assisted that by, the, by placing export taxes on rare earths and also export quotas. And that was a key driver of the shift of downstream manufacturing of rare earths in the 1990s and early 2000s. Fortunately, in 2012, Japan, the EU, and the US challenged these taxes and quotas as not according with good um, um, trade practice. And in 2014, um, they were forced, China was forced to remove those taxes and quotas. So from the 1st of January last year, the export quotas were removed. At the time, it didn't make much difference because China wasn't selling as much as its quotas. But from the 1st of May last year, the export taxes were reduced. Now, what that meant was, if you're, for instance, um, a phosphor manufacturer in Japan, the cost of the rare earths in producing a phosphor for your lighting is about 50%. Europium is key to that. The export tax on the phosphorus was 25%. In addition, the exports of unimproved rare earths do not get the VAT or GST refunded. And the VAT is about 16%. So a phosphor producer in Japan is effectively paying 41% more for their raw materials than their competitor in China. Those rare earths constitute 50% of the cost of producing a phosphor. That's just one example, and that's why they had to be eliminated. But nevertheless, what has happened is that uh, as a result of those measures, China has dominated and produces about 80, 90% of the world's rare earths. And it, through the downstream activities, it produces about 80, 90% of the world's magnets and, and other things. Now, and Professor Bogart, two years ago, put this graph up and said, well, this is the impact, and this is gradually, China is gradually moving downstream, and all the jobs associated with the production of these components and these original pieces of equipment are drifting to China. Um, now, when he put the graph up, he actually only put the red and purple lines up and these were dotted. So I have to take responsibility for that. But that just shows the impact of China's policies in ensuring that the value add takes place in China. So this move downstream, as I said, has been extraordinarily successful. And it's not only the taxes. China invests significantly in R&D and technology and education of individuals. Outside China, there's relatively few people who have expertise in, in rare earths, in, in the science and technology of it, or operating expertise. And that's been a big problem for uh, Linus in starting up, in, in employing staff and training them, educating them to operate a fairly sophisticated plant. The measures that were put in place, as I said, have now been discontinued. The analogy they like to use is that you can buy a bottle of wine from France, that's great, but they won't sell you grapes to produce your own wine. It's taken the US, Australia, Canada, South Africa, 20 to 30 years to develop a wine industry that's starting to be comparable with France. And that's 
the issue that we face in the rest of the world. We've got to commit to developing processes and edu to educating engineers, scientists, and operators so that we can develop and operate rare earth operations that can compete with those in China. So what's their agenda? China's agenda, uh, it hasn't actually increased production quotas. It has production quotas in, in place. And the idea is that by having these production quotas and awarding them to the six major companies that have been uh, charged with driving the industry forward, that they will control production. But unfortunately, the production quotas themselves are insufficient to meet Chinese demand, which effectively means that China is mandating illegal production. They're trying to eliminate illegal production, but it's very difficult and it's only partially successful. We continue with the analogy with France and the wining industry. In, in China, the rare earth industry is well known through the, throughout the country as something that they're very good at. And there's a whole lot of small operations which the government is taking a very long time to control. And I believe it's going to be many years before it is eradicated. Talked briefly about industry consolidation. China has charged um, six companies with carrying the industry forward. Environmental legislation, they have introduced new environmental standards and they are funding the implementation of those standards at an operational level. But nevertheless, in, in China, social harmony takes precedence over everything else. And if implementation of environmental legislation destroys too many jobs, the whole process is slowed down. So that's why it's taking a while to enforce those environmental standards. They're said to be introducing a rare earth certification, certification system. To me, I'm somewhat cynical about that. It's just another piece of paper that's open to be forged. So I don't see a lot of benefit from that. Um, they did propose the establishment of some international standards for rare earths. And I believe that's an opportunity for the rest of the world to work with China to establish some standards which can really have an impact on reducing the environmental impact of the illegal production in China. China has also introduced a resources tax or has intended, announced it will introduce a resources tax, which will be about 7 to 12% on light rare earths and 27% on heavy rare earths. The problem is that they don't quite know. The idea is they're going to put this tax in place on concentrates. But if you do that, by the time you go from the concentrates to the end product, there's only about 65% is produced, is of the separated rare earths are produced. Not everything you produce is sold. So the, the, the rare earth companies are saying, well, this, this is totally inappropriate. If you, if you allow for less than 100%, with, we allow for 65% recovery, and you allow for the fact you're not going to sell everything you produce. Effectively, the tax rates, resource taxes, about twice what they're talking about. So although they talked about introducing these resource taxes about this time last year, they're still talking about it. And I think it's going to be a while before they're introduced. They have announced they hope to have some measures in place by the end of this year. I think that's a possibility, and that's why I'm uh, forecasting some increase in prices towards the end of this year. That's China's forecast of uh, rare earth demand. It's interesting that they're forecasting a growth in demand for the hard hydrogen alloys of 20% per annum. In other words, they see a big increase in demand for hydrogen vehicles. And only recently we've seen announcements by BMW and Toyota that they're looking at developing some of these, um, some of these hydrogen vehicles. And Iwatani in Japan has a number of these hydrogen stations where if you have a, a hydrogen vehicle, you can go and recharge it with, uh, with hydrogen. So that's, uh, that's going to be very interesting to see how that plays out. The magnitude of the illegal problem was identified by Dr. Chen. Dr. Chen is a Deputy Director General of this uh, Chinese Rare Earth Society, and he's also Deputy Secretary of the Association of Chinese Rare Earth Industry. 2014, he noted that the demand 
for uh, demands for neodymium and praseodymium to meet the magnet production in China was about 30,000 tons. And yet, if you look at the production quotas, that would only generate 21,000 tons. So the difference is made up by illegal mining. And it's quite astounding that China will acknowledge that at one level, but at the other le on another level wants, wants to eliminate illegal mining. It can't possibly be illegal, eliminated totally until such time as they adjust the production quotas. And that's illustrated here. These are Chinese figures. Quite clearly in 2014, and the situation's got worse than then, their demand for neodymium and praseodymium was greater than the supply generated by their own production quotas. In other words, the left hand doesn't really know what the right hand's doing. The production quotas are issued by uh, the Ministry for Resources and La Land and Resources, and the, um, the magnet production is sort of overseen by the Ministry of uh, Industry and Information Technology. The result of this is that in 2014 and 2015, the Chinese industry the major producers have collectively lost money. This illegal production is not only preventing projects outside China, it's starting to really hurt in China. And they really, from where I stand, I really don't think they know how they're actually going to solve it. Because they don't want to destroy a whole lot of jobs, but on the other hand, they realize it's causing huge problems, particularly environmentally, and driving the cost of the materials down, which is making the large companies unprofitable. Now, the impact of this illegal mining is best demonstrated here by the change in prices. And we can see there's been a steady fall in prices over the last 18, 18 months. It's unsustainable. So, the situation today, collectively, the Chinese rare earth companies lost money, as I said, last year and the year before. Today, they're mining probably 300 to 400,000 tons of rare earths a year to achieve, to meet demand. It could well be more than that. And I know Jack Lifton is gonna talk about that later. He thinks my, my figures there are a little bit conservative. I'm quite prepared to acknowledge that and talk to him. That would be a good topic for discussion and how it could be addressed. I've talked several times about the magnet industry, the driver of the industry, and that's the driver primarily of the illegal production of rare earths in China. So how can we address this issue? I think it, China can't solve it itself. The rest of the world has to assist China, and for our own benefit, uh, we, we really must work with, with China on this, and I'm speaking in China in a couple of months. Uh, and I've decided I'm going to take a fairly forthright view. I don't know whether I'll be invited back again to tell them that they've got to get their house in order, but we'll, the rest of the world needs to play a part as well. They need to increase their production quotas. They need to make greater efforts to close down the illegal operations, and they need to work with the rest of the world to develop rare earth standards, particularly with reference to occupational health and safety. If we have standards there, then we're going to help to outlaw the, the illegal production. For the rest of the world, we need to make better efforts to ensure the magnets and the rare earth products that we buy are produced from illegal certificate, illegal production. I do know that's difficult. Production certificates can be purchased and forged, but we just need to make, in, a, in our long-term interests, a better, better efforts to ensure that that's what we do. And we need to work with China on these international standards so finally, by failing to eliminate the illegal mining and production of rare earths in a reasonable time frame, China and the major consumers are squandering the best rare earth resources on planet Earth. We must plan and, future f and plan for the future and succession. We can't just stand here and accept that prices of rare earths are very low because it's not going to continue. 
I, I was speaking to a conference in, 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 in Europe last year and I got a whole lot of blank faces looking at me and I said, well, it's a little bit like putting Dracula in charge of the, blood, the world's blood banks. We probably won't notice much for, for five to 10 years, but ultimately we're gonna to get to a stage where it's gonna impact upon supply. And the first thing that'll happen will be that China will cease exporting. Uh, so that's, that's the situation, it's very serious. Thank you.